Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I explore the world of geocaching. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. You can also follow Geo Adventures on Buy Me a Coffee for a behind the scenes look on every episode. That's one word G E O Adventures. It's free to follow, or you can become a member and unlock exclusive posts and information. Your memberships go a long way for helping support the podcast and are greatly appreciated. Hi, everybody. Amy, Shadow Dragon One here, and with me today is Chris, one of the hosts of Geocaching in the Northwest. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be here, Amy. You were just on my podcast, Caching in the Northwest, last week. I think it'll be two weeks by the time this comes out, but time is irrelevant. Exactly. Uh, it was fantastic to to talk with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me on mine today to talk to with you again. It was a lot of fun coming on your guys' podcast. I'm really excited to have you on this one today. Fantastic. How about we get going? Sounds perfect. So first of all, could you tell everybody what your geocaching name is? It's Chris of the Northwest. Now, I had another geocaching name that... Um, I started, in fact, this is my third. I guess that kind of makes me fickle. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, the last one, suddenly it, it was funny at the time. And then throughout the years, suddenly became politically incorrect. So oh. I uh, <laughs> it's like, you know, I should change this. This, this isn't right. So uh, anyway, that's. Uh, I, I came up with Chris of the Northwest, kind of like George of the Jungle, right? Everybody can seem to remember that. <laughs> so how did you start geocaching? Actually, I started with my uh, my best friend, Wits End. He went out and he got a, a GPS for his car uh, and found a way to hook it up to his PDA. This is back in the day before smartphones, uh, you know, and and... Uh, he took, he discovered geocaching while he was visiting family down in California. And he came back up and he said, I found this really cool thing. We got to go do it. So that day at lunch, we worked together. And so we went out to lunch and wandered in, in a field there and didn't find anything. I'm like, huh, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what I'm looking for. This is kind of fun, but, you know, I'm supposed to find something. And we didn't. We probably spent (laughs) half an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Um, But we decided we weren't going to give up and we went back after work. And that's when we found it. It was a shaving cream container. Okay. That was just in with other trash, right? So it didn't look out of place. But, um, you know, you take and you can twist the bottom off and there's the, there was the uh, log in that. And I like, Oh, this is so cool. <laughs> That's a pretty neat one. I haven't seen a container like that yet. I haven't seen one since. Uh, you know, they're they're designed to keep your money safe in the house, right? You can yeah. put thousand dollars in the shaving cream, put it right there in your in your uh, bathroom, and nobody's going to think a thing of it. That's pretty cool. So before we get started in today's subject, tell us a little bit about your podcast. How did you get started podcasting? Uh, I started in, boy, I started geocaching in 2004. I probably started podcasting soon after 2005, 2006. Um, I th- one day on Twitter, I threw out a question of how do you pronounce the letters C-I-T-O, right? Yes. <laughs> and that's still a thing today. Nobody quite knows how to pronounce it. <laughs> it depends on what part of the country you're from. Yeah. Um, and I got a lot of responses and I thought, huh, this is kind of cool. I bet I could ask a geocaching question every day and people would respond. So I started the geocaching question of the day on Twitter and, um, and it took off. And so soon after that, uh, the geocaching podcast back in those days, it was X punk X and Daryl W four mm-hmm. and, uh, picked it up and said, Hey, do you get, do you want to do a, a a bit, you know, just a piece on the show every week. I said, I'd love to. And of course, you know, when you first start out podcasting, the sound of your own voice is really odd. You know, you're not used to yourself talking that often. Yes. And am I talking too fast? Am I talking too slow? 
how do I enunciate properly? So I learned all these things um, by just doing a five minute segment on the geocaching podcast. And then uh, soon after that, uh, Daryl W4 went out and started the geo gearheads and he asked me to come along and, and help. And we did that for, boy, I want to say close to 10 years. And that show just shut down last year as uh, Daryl was the primary on that show and he had a job change and, you know, it's just, it was really hard for him to schedule and be there and, and do all the work that is involved in a, in a weekly podcast. Yeah. Um, so I also started a podcast with Wits End called, oddly enough, Caching in the Northwest. Uh, at that time, there were several regional podcasts. And okay. I thought, you know what? There was nothing even, it seemed like much on the West Coast, right? You had Podcasher, who's the 800-pound gorilla of, of geocaching podcasts. Um, and, but, but they, while they were focused um, maybe on California, they, there was, theirs was a truly global show. There was nothing local to the Northwest. And I thought that was a niche I could fill. Okay. And uh, I figured, you know what? This should be pretty easy. We'll do a monthly podcast. How, I mean, we can always find time once a month to get together and record. Well, that proved also to be a challenge. <laughs> um, having, having young kids, you know, we were both running kids to soccer or baseball or football or swimming, whatever they were doing. Cause you know, kids require a lot of travel time. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> I don't have to tell you, do I? Um, and we uh, Wits End and I both worked together uh, in a basement office. We were the IT department for a church and school. And, um, you know, we, we thought, well, no problem. We can get together once a month and knock this out. It, it turned out to be difficult. Um, you know, we would wait till after work and then I'd pull out my little podcasting cart, hand out the microphones, get the recorder going, and we'd record. And, and I found it difficult to, um, material wasn't hard to come by but the timing to get it done and get it out every month became more and more of a struggle. And there was a point I thought, you know what, if I can't put it out on a consistent schedule, it's not worth doing this. Uh, so the podcast almost died. And then land monkey came along. He contacted us. He said, I love the show, love the local feel of it. Uh, but I see the shows haven't been posted in a couple of months. Is there anything I can do to help? And this is just soon after I started with Daryl W4 and we were using uh, Google Hangouts on air. It was, it was a brand new thing. Nobody had used this yet. And, and we moved to a weekly format. And I thought, you know what? It's much easier to do a weekly show than it is to do a monthly show. Really? Uh, because, because there, you've got routine. I know every Thursday night where I'm going to be. I can plan on that. Okay. So we, uh, I was recording with Daryl W for um, my time Thursday at 6 p.m. And then we started recording Caching in the Northwest uh, around 10 p.m. Because we knew Thursday night, 10 p.m., the kids are in bed. You know, we're not going out on date night because that happens on Friday, right? You know, there's... By 10 o'clock, everything's calmed down and we could do a show. And we started doing that. We brought Land Monkey into the picture in about, um, well, I think he jumped in around 30 episodes in. So since then, now that it's on Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Pacific, each and every week, it's so much easier to plan for. And now you're well over 400 episodes. Yes, yes. We're a couple of months away from our 500th episode. That's, so, that's incredible. It, 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 I'm shocked, to be honest <laughs> with you. I don't know. I can't remember any of the two or three hundreds, right? And <laughs> it just went right on by. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of episodes. That's a lot of content. I'm sure at some point you kind of revisit topics as things change in the geocaching world. Yes. But you also have the unique element of you do a live stream for your podcast that came with the hangouts on air so that was live um 
since then, Hangouts on Air has closed, right? So I can tell you all the things that have failed throughout the years, but <laughs> the podcast keeps going. We change and we adapt. Um, we're not, right now using uh, a StreamYard, which I think is an incredible platform for this. We can have up to 10 people live. Um, and it's very well done platform. And you know what? I know you're going to think I'm a little bit crazy. Maybe you already do. I can tell you're, you're laughing. You already think I'm a little bit crazy. Um, but you're pandemic, a podcaster. You have to be a little yeah. bit crazy. <laughs> you're right. The pandemic helped podcasters because now all of the guests know how to use a microphone and a camera. That's true. <laughs> you know, I mean, all the I Zoom would, meetings and everything yes, else that had yes. to happen during the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. I would line up guests and schedule them for maybe a Tuesday or Wednesday a week beforehand to say, okay, here, you know, show me your gear. Let's see if I can hear you. You can hear me. We can see each other. And now, you know, I just schedule them and say, hey, come on about half an hour before everybody's ready to go. And it's been so much easier, at least on the guest side. Yeah, that's, you know, I never really thought about that because I actually kind of started right ironically right before the pandemic hit I started putting my podcast together mm -hmm. and then it was about oh a few months in before I started bringing guests on so the pandemic was well underway at that point and it never mm -hmm. occurred to me that if I had done this prior to that point that there may have been people that didn't know how to use zoom mm -hmm. but that's that's a very interesting point Yes. Um, for geo gearheads, Daryl had a set of equipment, a camera and a headset that he would mail people ahead of time here, use this, you know, set it up. We'll do a test to make sure everything works, but here's some good equipment so that, you know, you look and sound good. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, the, in, in that one very specific way, the pandemic has helped in so many other ways it's hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of wild. Oh, well, you're here today to talk with us about caching etiquette. And there's a lot of different areas of geocaching and different types of etiquette. So how about we start with finding etiquette? Because everybody who geocaches finds a geocache at some point. So this is something we can all relate to. So what would be considered good finding etiquette? You know, everybody's going to have different opinions on this. Oh, of course. I'm telling you mine are right, right off the bat. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's not true. Um, I'm sure people are going to say, oh, well, you missed this. You missed this. But here are the big points, right? Of course, you have to bring a pen to sign the log. If you do not sign the log, you did not make the find. Period. End of discussion. Yeah, that's like the one rule from yeah. headquarters is sign the log. Don't send me a picture of the cache and say, here, I found it. Oops, I forgot my pen. I hope this counts. No, it doesn't. Did you sign the log? If you didn't sign the log, you didn't find the cache. So there, I said it. <laughs> That being said, I have gone out and realized I don't have a pen on me. <laughs> I, I found other things. I found a, a sharp stick and a leaf can work well, right? Okay. You just put the leaf on there, kind of like carbon paper in the old days, but you take that chloroform, oh. that, the green, and you can, you can put your name on there. And that works really well. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, some people said they've signed in blood. I've never gone quite that far. I've heard people say that, but I've never seen any proof of it. So yeah. I, I don't know if it's like an urban legend kind of thing or if it's yeah, actually I, happened. That's that's a little too hardcore for me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I usually go find a good sturdy leaf and and a stick and go that way. Um, I have, you know, hiked in, didn't have a pen. You know, now I'll be honest. The first thing I look for is a near, another nearby cache that may have a pen. Okay. Like I've gone, uh, let's find this one. Oh, look, there's a pen. Okay, hold on. I'm going to go back and sign this one. I'll come back and put the pen back. Good. I did it. <laughs> That's added more time. And I, I have done that, but um, I'm a stickler that if you don't sign the log, 
you didn't find the cache. Now, if the log is incredibly full, that's a problem, right? So right. take a take a log with you. Um, I I have a Tilly hat. This has become my favorite hat. The brand and name is Tilly, T-I-L-L-Y. In the top of the hat, there's a small pocket. And in there, I keep different sized right in the rain logs. So oh. that as I'm out caching, I'm like, oh, I need a log. Wait, I have one with me. Take off my hat, pull it out. You know, I can update that because I usually tend not to carry a fanny pack or a backpack because you know what? It's a quick one. I'm just going to go out and back. Why do I need to carry my cash maintenance kit with me? Well, I should, but I don't. <laughs> I have not heard of a hat with a pocket like that. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, Tilly, where did I get it? I got it at Bass Pro Shop. And of course, you can get them online. You can get them wherever. Um, but it's it's completely crushable and Pops right back up and waterproof. And here in the Northwest, you need everything waterproof. You get a lot of rain up there. You get a lot of rain. Speaking of signing the log in a lot of rain, I'll give this one story. Okay. Uh, I went, have you found a flat cache? It's a, it's a magnetic, it's a big magnet, maybe on a transformer or something. And yes. on the back of it, it's got a log taped to it. Yes. This, this had a right in the rain log. And I flipped it over and I looked and I go, well, there's no signatures on it. Huh. I know I can't be first to find. They must have just changed it. And I and I sign my name and I start to see the ink start to run a little bit. And I'm like, oh, you know what? This is on the rainy side of this transformer. It's just getting pounded with rain. So it's slowly erasing all the ink off the paper. Oh wow. <laughs> just self-renewing uh log. I thought this is kind of genius. That's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> As, as long as you're not one of those COs that wants to compare signatures to the online finds, that's kind of a neat sort of self-maintaining log. <laughs> if you're a CEO who doesn't want to go out and maintain logs, that's a great way to do it. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So what else is good etiquette when you're finding geocaches? Um, the most important thing, one of the most important things is to put it back the way you found it. Yes. Right. Don't think, hey, you know what? This was hidden okay, but you know what? Over here, that's a much better place. That's the first place I looked because that's where I wouldn't have hidden it, would have hidden it. I'm going to put it there. Well, don't. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're in contact with the CO and say, hey, you know, I, I've done this. I've come up and I go, well, the cash is laying out in the open and all the contents are spilled out. Huh. That's probably not the way it was intended. Yeah. So I put that in my log. And then I said, I put it where I think it was. Um, later, contact the CO and say, hey, here's the situation. Here's the pictures I took. And here's what I, where I hit it when I was done. And of course, they were thankful. And, but they said, you know what? That isn't exactly the hiding place. Don't worry. I'll go fix it. So. Yeah. When it's left out in the, when it's obviously not supposed to be where it got left. You kind of just kind of have to do the best you can and let the CEO yeah. know, like you said. And, you know, there are some, I'm going to say it, terrible hides, right? I mean, I, I found some geotour caches where the container is chained underneath a bench. Yeah. Well, it's chained to the bench. It's not going anywhere, but I look, you can see it a mile away and it, and it looks terrible. Like, I would like to be able to hide it behind that tree. That would be a better spot but I can't because it's chained here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it very obviously belongs there in that case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and as far as, you know, you bring up a good point about if something's out of place and letting the CO know, just reporting any issues you see is something that I don't think every cashier does. And I wish that they did. No. Um, you know, Take a, uh, now, I know some geocachers who take a picture at every single geocache. That's, that's a little much, in my opinion. Um, but taking a picture of it, if you don't think it's in the right place or it doesn't look right, you know, the lid is cracked 
and water's going to start to get in again, Northwest, lots of water, right? You've got to have a good waterproof container. Don't use those little, um, uh, Ziploc sandwich boxes, the, the yeah. really cheap Tupperware, those don't hold up. Um, you know, get a good quality container. And if something doesn't look right, you know what? Take a picture, contact the CO and say, hey, this is how I found it. It just didn't seem right. Or if the area has changed, you know, hey, walking in, I noticed no trespassing signs that nobody mentioned before. Did something change? That's a good point, too. Mm -hmm. What about logs when it comes to logging caches, logging DNFs and writing logs, what kind of etiquette is there for that? Because there, Boy. that is just one thing that I is mm -hmm. as a CO drives me nuts when I get literally, a, I've got nothing but a period before. Yes. For a fine log. Yeah. It's like, I don't, I, I don't want to count that as a real log. Sorry. You know, <laughs> I thought TFTC was rude until you get just the period. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's because um, geocaching HQ doesn't allow an empty log, or we would yeah. be getting those. I've actually gotten one with a space once. So it okay. looked empty, but it technically counts as a character, so it lets you log it. <laughs> I, I just don't know what to say. Um, yeah, that was... As, as a CO, I put work into that cache, Okay. In some cases, it may not be a lot. In other cases, it may have been I created a container, found the perfect location, you know, created this container to match so that it blends in and it's in, you know, view. Perhaps I spent a long time uh, finding the right location in this area where this container, you know, can hide nicely. You know, I personally didn't go out and just, you know, take a... Um, uh, film canister, put a log in it, toss it into some bushes and say, there, I hit a cache. Good enough. And if I get a, a log, like, you know, dot or even TFTC, yeah, I kind of earned that one, but no, I put time into my caches. And I think as a cache -er, um, you should put a little bit of effort into your log. Now I'm not saying write a story. Right. On on my podcast, Caching in the Northwest, each week we read a glow or a geocache log of the week. And some of these are epic stories. Some of them are are pure um, creations of fiction and they're hilarious. <laughs> right. One of the shorter ones is my wife told me it wasn't there. It wasn't. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know, in this case, listen to your wife. She was right. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't have to be long to be good. A lot of people like to put in the adventure they had to get to the cache and not necessarily the hunt for the container itself. So um, I don't mind the cache logs that, you know, uh, we just had Geo Woodstock and the 20th anniversary celebration here. So there are a lot of cache logs and they're still coming in that are in German, let's say, and English or some I've gotten just in Dutch. Right. Okay. I can't read Dutch, but you know what? They put some effort into it and it may be the same log they used everywhere. Hey, here's our journey. We started, you know, we landed it in Seattle and we went down to California and back up to Colorado. Great. You know, at least you've told a little bit of something. You put a little effort into that. Yeah. So, um, in my logs, I use Cashly to log 99% of my finds. And they have a template in there, right? They have different templates. So I will create a template if I'm out with some people for the day. Hey, I'm out with this group of people. Um, and we are, you know, driving from Seattle to Spokane, finding caches, you know, found your cache. You know, I always put in there that the container or the, the condition of the container and log for the owner, just so that, you know, if you get TFTC, you have no idea if, okay, they found it. Perhaps all your swag is moldy. That happens here in the Northwest. <laughs> um, but TFTC doesn't tell you that. Yeah. You know, at least I go and say, hey, the container uh, and log are in good shape. Or the container's in good shape. The log is getting full. You might want to change it in the next few weeks. 
um, you know, or these geo coins weren't there that were supposedly logged into that cache. So I let them know. So you you started caching not at the very beginning, but fairly early on in geocaching. Mm -hmm. So as geocaching has adapted and the use of smartphones has come into play, do you think that has caused, for lack of a better term, log quality to deteriorate? Because it is a lot harder to type out, you know, something log on a smartphone versus typing something on your computer at home. I agree with the first part, not necessarily with the second. Okay. Have you seen the speeds at which kids can text these days? No, because I don't have any kids of okay. texting age in my house. <laughs> I, I used to work in high school and I was amazed at how accurately kids could text and their hand and phone were underneath the desk the whole time. You never even looked at the screen. Okay. Okay. So okay. now... Um, another thing I use is uh, the voice dictation feature, right? Okay. So as I'm walking back from the cache, I can hit that little microphone. Hey, I found your cache while walking in the woods today. The container is in good shape. Thank you very much. Done. And you know what? I'm still looking where I'm walking, right? So I'm not trying to text and type on a, on a trail, on an uneven trail. Um, but, you know, that's an option. Uh, back in the day, you know, I mean, I would, uh, I had a binder of geocache printouts, you know, of cache pages, um, that I kept in my car just in case I happened to be near something and I'd go look. And, uh, you know, so there when you had to find it and then come back and type, you know what, if you found 10 caches in a day, TFTC is maybe all you got. Yeah. But no, I think the. The smartphone is both a blessing and a curse. It's made geocaching so much more accessible. You know, during the pandemic, we learned of a lot of people who picked up geocaching because it's something they could do on their own, right? Or with their family, with their, with their COVID bubble people. Yeah. Um, and go out into nature at the same time. So that's great. But yes, it, it, it has, um, denigrated the logs a bit, but it doesn't have to because people communicate on these phones all day long. So very well. I mean, I'm shocked that my daughter gets a phone call, right? I didn't know her phone could do that because she's only on there typing all day long. <laughs> okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't type. I fat finger a lot mm -hmm. more on my phone and get a lot more typos trying to type out on my phone than I do my keyboard because I'm used to my home row and my two little buttons and, and typing out and trying to type fast on my smartphone. My mom and my friends, they, they love to just read my text because the typos just keep them rolling, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> um, but that's true. But Children now are digital natives. They've grown up with this technology. This is all they've known, right? Yeah. You put them in front of a keyboard and they slow down because they don't know how to reach all the letters with just their thumbs. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. It's, so it's very I, I have different. to think we're looking at it from two different generations. Definitely. And I don't think that, that means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what about taking a picture of the cache and posting it in your fine log? Is that considered good etiquette? Boy, that depends on the cache. Okay. Uh, if it is a high difficulty cache, no, that's not good etiquette because then you know where it is and how to go find it. If it's a, it, here, it's right here out in the open. Good luck getting the container open. Then, okay. Um, do I have a problem with the container open and a picture of the contents? Not so much. Sometimes I, if I can't find a cache, the first thing I do is go look at the pictures because more than likely somebody has done just that. 
Here, I found it. I opened it up right here on the ground next to where it was hiding, and I took a picture of it. Wait, well, there it is. It's under that bush. Oh, hey, how about that? <laughs> See that unusual piece of concrete? That tells you exactly where it is. So uh, I've done that too. Look through the pictures yeah. to see if it at least, even if they're just holding the container and it's not yeah. in its spot, to try to get some other hints. Yeah. Of what most it is. most people are lazy, right? So they're going to take <laughs> a picture exactly where they found it. Here, I'm going to turn around, take a picture, <laughs> and oh, it was right. They were standing right here when they took that picture. Um. So I don't like it but I use it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not necessarily going to post picture, but you'll go check out the pictures if it gives you an advantage, if you need it. Yeah. yeah. I love pictures around the cash area or going on the hike up to it. Those are yeah. fantastic. You know, Oh, look at this beautiful mountain or the, you know, the flowers were blooming today. I took a picture of that. Oh, look at this cute little squirrel. You know, that's great. Or yeah. even the pictures of the group. You know, here's the group that went out and got it. We did this for a milestone cache or some such. Here's who I cached with. This is yeah. what I yeah. discovered while geocaching. Those are always like fun mm -hmm. pictures. So what about when you're hiding geocaches? What is good hiding etiquette? First and foremost, always get permission. Yes. I can't tell you the number of times that I'm looking for a cache going, there is no way they got permission to do this. Really? Right? Yeah. Um, you're just looking and going, uh, so um, a few years ago, we had one Chick-fil-A in town. Okay. okay. I know that's hard to imagine just one. Um, and the drive through was full all the time. This geocache was a magnetic cache on the back of a transformer right in the line for Chick-fil-A. The only time you could get it was Sunday. Oh. I'm like, there's no way they got permission for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Others, you know, I've been looking for a cache and the property manager comes up. Hey, can I help you? What are you looking for? Oh, obviously you don't know there's a geocache here then. Somebody hit a geocache on your property here. I, I'm looking to find it. You're like, oh, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah. Yeah. I should have gotten permission. So when you run across those instances, what do you do? Um, I put it in my log, to be honest. Uh, I, I'm not afraid to stir the pot and say, hey, you know, I was out looking. Property manager came by. Um, I showed him the cache and where it was. He did not know it was here. CO, that's all on you. Go yeah. fix it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really sad when people do that because it can give geocaching a bad reputation. Right. Exactly. And that's what gets it banned from certain areas. Mm -hmm. or... And if it's a high difficulty cache, there's going to be some collateral damage in the area, right? You're going to stomp around the bushes trying to look for it. And perhaps, you know, oops. Sorry, I, I may have stepped on a flower. I didn't mean to. I was looking somewhere else. Oops, sorry. Um, but I'm one person. You get, you know, 100 people doing that, and suddenly this flower bed is destroyed because they didn't get permission to put it there. Yeah. So getting permission coordinates. <sighs> <laughs> Early smartphones were terrible for coordinates, um, you know, and um, in the early days, I could tell you once I found the cache, what brand GPS they hit it with, you know, because a Garmin, I had a Garmin, it was usually pretty close. Oh, but they're using a DeLorme, which, you know, put it off 25 feet, always to the east. And, oh. <laughs> you know. Oh, they used this one. That put it off, you know, 25 feet to the west. <laughs> huh. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, early on with, with GPS units, each one had their own, you know, their own uh, problems. 
quirks. There you go. Um, so that was fun. Now I know a geocacher, a hider who would purposely put the coordinates off 10, 15, 20 feet. He said, and added a star of difficulty to it. Oh, that just seems mean. That's wrong, right? That No, I'm just making it harder. So you just can't walk up to it. Like, no, that's not how the game is played. Yeah, you, you already have a 10 foot plus or minus tolerance. Mm-hmm. And then add another 10 foot. So you could be up to 20 feet off from where you really want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. It's bad. Um, I had a, uh, I'm, I'm an iPhone guy. So I had an iPhone eight and I thought, wow, this is great until I went geocaching with it. And I would stand there in one spot and turn on the map view and watch the dot jump all around. It's, you know, I was like, okay. So I go out. I mean, one time I'm, I'm, you know, walking with people and, oh, it's, it's 30 feet this way. No, it's right here. We just found it. Uh, but, uh, oh yeah, this phone stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I trust you. I once had a smartphone that when I started geocaching, it worked great, but something internally with the GPS unit went awry and it would just stop like even trying to navigate with google maps or something it would just stop the gps would just stop and wouldn't navigate or anything and i was geocaching one time and i was probably i i was close to ground zero but when i pulled up the map to get a better navigation suddenly it showed me two miles away from the cache. I said, yeah. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So with, I can't tell you. Oh, go ahead. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a geocache where you read in the description. Oh, God, or, or find a maintenance log that says, oh, coordinates were off. Use these now instead. Mm-hmm. And I ne I do not understand why the CEO doesn't update the coordinates. Well, now somebody my, already did for them. Yeah, but not in the actual location. Right. right. But, not but, anywhere that, you know, it's quick and easy when you're out on the trail to find it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't get it. Um, um with smartphones today i will turn off all other applications that are using navigation of any kind yes and you know allow just the geocaching app to go do it now you know i you still get it, i still use the maps to go from location to location but when i get there i kill that application and then you know let the geocaching application have 100 use of the gps i don't know if that helps but at least in my mind, it does. I I want to say, I don't know with current smartphones if it does, but I want to say with like some of the older versions, mm -hmm. it made a difference because I I know I I would have, like say you're, you're using a fitness tracker to track your, your walk and then pull up Pokemon Go or something, and then you go back to your fitness tracker and you see the line is darted all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if if the smartphones that we have now, if it makes any difference, but I definitely think it, it definitely doesn't hurt and it definitely right. made a difference at some point. Right. Um, you know, I always double check my coordinates of, of hiding a cache with Google Maps. Now, Google Maps has its own quirks as well, but at least it shows me, yep, you know what? I, I walked in from the, I can see the parking lot. I walked in from there and that should be about right. Okay. You've taken, you've used yeah. two different things to get approximately exactly. the same reading, then you know you're in the ballpark. And there are applications to do um, coordinate averaging, you know, set your phone on top of the cache, let it sit there for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes as the GPS, you know, settles down and finally focuses on a spot. 
that works well. So use things like that. Or, and you know what? If you're not sure, have somebody beta test it. Hey, I just hit a cache at this location. Can you find it? My GPS was acting up or my phone was acting up. You know, before That's a you good point. Test. That's a good point. Because we always say to go have somebody beta test adventure labs. But I don't think I've ever heard somebody... I've, I've heard somebody say, have somebody beta test a night cache because you mm -hmm. know, you know, for night caching or a puzzle cache or a mm -hmm. puzzle cache, but yeah, I don't think I've ever had, I can't recall anybody. Somebody's going to send me an Instagram saying, no, I told you that I just, they are. I just can't think of somebody <laughs> telling me to do that with just a regular traditional cache. But so what about what one thing that gets so irritating? I hear a lot of people say this in other areas is so many times they come up on what's supposed to be a small geocache and it's actually a micro. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that should be part of hiding etiquette to mark the container size correctly. But some yeah. of that is to interpretation as well. Yes, uh, I, the um, geocaching HQ's uh, uh, help topics on hiding gives you an idea of what a container size should be. But you know what? In some areas, you know, the, the containers kind of morph, right? Well, this is kind of a small. This is... Well, you know, we've got Ted over there using this particular type of container and he calls it a small, so I will too. You know, whatever that is. So that can happen um, in a local area and then, you know, kind of spread out from there. But for the most part, I um, I typically find the container size is accurate. That's That's the one thing most people can agree on. The, I should say probably the only thing people agree on when hiding. <laughs> uh, but the containers do change over time. They do. Right? So, oh, it's gone missing. I replaced it. And then they never went and changed the listing that says it was a micro and now it's a small. So I'm looking in all these tiny places where there's no way the container could be now once I find it. I'm like, well, why was I looking there? Look at this thing. Well, because that wasn't what was in the spoiler pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we kind of had the opposite over the summer where it was marked a large cache. And at some point the container got replaced, but it was never noted on the cache page or on the size. And it was very much small when we finally found it. Mm -hmm. Big difference. <laughs> so is this a good time to mention don't ever do a, a throwdown? Oh, it's oh, it's never a bad time to mention. <laughs> um, I was do oh Daryl and I were doing the donut trail in okay. Ohio, I believe it was. Um, and we both went towards the coordinates. We went on each side of this large rock, and we both came up with a film canister. Oh, <laughs> like oh, huh, huh? Wonder which one's the real one? Yeah. And then we went into the donut shop and said something. They're like, yeah, somebody said it was missing. So we went and put another one out. Well, okay, but no, don't do that. <laughs> okay, that's one thing for the, the, I guess they're technically the CO. But for a finder to say, you know, it should be here. It's not. I'm going to put one here. That's terrible. Even if you're group caching, I'm throwing this out there, even if you're group caching and somebody else has found it, right? Hey, when I found it, it was right there. It's not right there now. Let's go ahead and put another one down. You guys are close enough. Claim the find. No, that's for the CO to say, right? I've, I've come across a, a strip of Velcro stapled up underneath a piece of wood. But, well, I found the Velcro, but the cache is gone. And the cache owner says, that's where it's supposed to be. You found the spot. Go ahead and log it. I'm going to replace it. Yeah, I suppose. I didn't sign the log. Mm, I don't know if I should log this one or not. I once found 
So when, when I get a DNF, I like to put it on my watch list so then mm -hmm. I can see if somebody else finds it or maintenance is done or whatever. And this one geocache was at a telephone pole, supposed to be at the base of a telephone pole. There had apparently been a recent accident before I went through there to find it. And the telephone pole was smithereens on the ground. And I looked around, I could not find this thing. And I, I marked the DNF and I noted it in my log that, hey, this, this pole is not there anymore. The new one's not even in place yet. Within a couple of days, somebody marked a find. Yeah. There was no owner I found the log pole. no oh. nothing. And I was like, did they? But then other people started marking fines on it too, but there was never a maintenance log. And I was like, what did they do? And then I learned what a throwdown was. Oh, yeah. And I highly suspect that that is probably what happened. Yeah. But I don't know for sure. But I, I highly suspect that because that poll was trashed and yep. there was no poll in place. Um, I have been asked by by previous, can I, is it right to say a previous DNFer, right? Somebody who didn't find the cache and I went up and found it. And they're like, wait, wait, where did you find it? And, you know, what was the, what was the log? I said, well, some of these log entries went back to 2014. You found the original container. There's a newer one somewhere. Uh, I don't know. I found a geocache container at the site with, you know, an old log in it. So I figured I found it. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, you probably notice I'm a little opinionated. So, <laughs> Isn't no everybody? Throwdowns. Yeah. <laughs> no throwdowns. Just don't do it. No, oh, I, I agree with you. That kind of, especially on an old cache that obviously hasn't been maintained. Mm -hmm. It's just. When it's not being maintained, it just needs to get archived and go away and let somebody else come along that is I willing heard, to maintain it. I've heard so many discussions on this. Right. Well, what if it's, you know, one that fits a Jasmine space that is very difficult to find? Well, but also the CO is no longer in the game. So I'm just going to, the, the community is going to keep it going. You know what? Maybe it's time to go. Yeah, I realize it's going to be a, you know, it's it's an important cache in one aspect of the game, but maybe it's time to let it go. So yeah, but... that's that's a tough one, right? Um, it, oh, this is a great historic cache. Well, let's let's say Mingo, right? What happens if the CEO of Mingo quits the game? What do we do? Do we keep that going because it's the oldest cache in America? Is that the value? of that cash or is it the value of a good find a good quality find yeah you just gotta hope if somebody just stops geocaching they really either need to archive their caches or find somebody who's active mm -hmm. willing to take them on because it just right especially when you have kids with you geocaching there's little worse than finding a geocache that's busted and broken. Everything is wet and soggy mm -hmm. and not maintained. Yes. Yes. And, you know, that goes right into good hiding etiquette. If you're not going to maintain the geocache, why are you even hiding it? Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. If you've got DNFs, go and look. Now, now perhaps we're, I think we're yet to talk about a cache that I considered my nemesis cache for quite some time, right? Um, this one has a lot of DNFs on it. You know, if you know that as a cache owner, yeah, so I get 10, 20 DNFs in a row. I'll go check on it maybe then. Okay, you know, but if you've got a, you know, a skirt lifter, in a Walmart parking lot and it's got 10 DNFs. Yeah. You should get out there. If it's got two DNFs, you should get out there. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's so definitely it, something said for if it's a high, you know, if it's a four or five difficulty level, you kind of expect mm -hmm. to get DNFs, at least some of them. Right. But if it's supposed to be a simple parking grab. It you shouldn't go out be and eat Yeah. Um, maybe I mentioned that we had a couple of large events this summer in this area. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you've missed that point. Uh, but we had a couple of large events in this area. And uh, as uh, the local representative for our geocaching association, I reached out uh, to all of our members and said, hey, now's a good time. Let's go replace the logs in all of our caches, make sure they're in good shape. You know, they seal well before thousands of people come and try to find them. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that is brilliant. That is a very good idea. Yeah. So, you know, company's coming. Let's clean up the house a little bit. Yeah. The very first Mingo I went to and did the geo tour that was there, they had, I mean, they were between a small and a regular box, like the, those waterproof boxes that you get for camping that you can mm -hmm. put papers and stuff in. Bigger than a lock and lock, but smaller than an ammo can. Not a single one of them had any swag in it. And there were kids crawling all over the place mm -hmm. looking for these geocaches. And I couldn't believe that knowing that this was going on. Because they had a, a community celebration of Brent as part of the geo tour and everything else, too. So it was like you you were planning on all these people showing up. And it just seemed like nobody had gone and mm -hmm. done anything with them. And I was very surprised by that. Yeah. Well, you mentioned swag. I think we should jump to swag. That's part of maintenance. If your container is big enough to contain swag, make sure it's got good swag in it. Because there is nothing more disappointing for a child than opening a container and it's empty or the swag is nasty. Right. It's dirty, slimy, wet, whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that for the children, that is one of the major draws of geocaching. For sure. So that could could be for the adults too. Huh. Some cases. <laughs> <laughs> um, around here, you know, if you if you've got a business card, right? That has a business card's sized card with all your geocaching information. Hey, I was here. That's nice. But if that container gets damp, that card is going to soak, soak up all that moisture and it's going to be sitting there as pulp in the bottom yeah. of the geocache, which is nasty. So while I like that idea in certain environments here in the Northwest, at least put it in a, in a zip bag of some sort, right? So that it's if it does get wet, it's self-contained and you can just pick and drop it out, <laughs> pick it up and drop it out. Yeah. Here in Missouri, we don't get nearly the rain that you guys get, but the amount of humidity that we get in this area, mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar because, you know, July and August, when we have 100% humidity, the condensation builds up in a lot of those plastic containers and yeah. we get the same effect. Yeah. So the desiccant packs can't keep up. They're they're designed to keep moisture out, but not water. Yeah. Right. So, you know, those are nice. That's that's a nice thing to toss in. But, you know, just I I prefer if you're going to leave swag, leave it in a plastic bag of some sort so that it's isolated. Yeah. Especially anything cloth, right? I'm thinking oh, stuff in. Yes. Toys. Or stickers. Yes. Um, bubbles. I've been finding bubbles a lot in geocaches. And, you know, bubble containers are not designed to lay on their side for weeks on end. Yeah, bubbles are, are and, and, and liquids in general are just a big no. No, they, so they, they'll leak out over time. And I can understand, hey, I left something there. It's non-toxic and, and it's fun, but maybe not bubbles. And not fruit snacks. I can't tell you oh. how many geocaches we found that have a pack of fruit snacks in it. Mm -hmm. 
And now that my son's a bit older, he understands why he can't eat those fruit snacks. But when he was <laughs> five, but I want the right. fruit snacks, I'm hungry. Right. No, no, I will go to the gas station and get you something else. We're, I don't know how long these have sat in here. They're the same type we have at home. Yeah, yes, exactly. Oh, I home. like those ones. Like, no, yeah. no, I don't no. have any idea how old these are. Right. And it's, it's against the guidelines to put any food of any kind into a geocache because it will attract critters, be that ants, insects, um, rodents, or anything larger, right? Um, yeah. I, we have people that love to use peanut butter jars around here. And they say, well, you know, I run it through the dishwasher, you know, until I can't smell peanut butter on it anymore. Yeah, but I bet your dog can. <laughs> yeah. You know, that have, you know 10,000 times better sniffing power than you do so the animals can smell that on there and they'll come over and move things around not all muggles are humans that's right that's right so when it comes to trading swag they just always don't do it. But just <laughs> oh. oh sorry sorry I, i've been saying that too often <laughs> just don't do it well that's what a pro <laughs> but yeah, when the kid wants to work. trade yeah. <laughs> And there's always the very tough decision for kids of which piece to take. Right. And sometimes they want to trade multiple. So what, and again, this is opinion based and everybody's going to say something different. What would you say is the max number of items to trade out? As many as you have with you. <laughs> That's fair. You take yeah. something, leave something. So right yeah. now, my two children are are complete opposites in this. Right, my girl will go, oh, that's pretty. I want that. And my son will take the time, pull everything out, and analyze. Do I want this or this? This or th you know, and go through one by one until he figures out I want this one. I'm like, come on, <laughs> we got to go find another cash. Let's go. <laughs> but no, he has to lay everything out and compare, and then he'll make his choice. Um, now I'm going to throw a question back at you. If you okay. don't have swag, is money okay? You know, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Cause I've seen coins in there before. And I think it depends on what you traded for and how much you left. Because, you know, if you're just, if you grab it, if you're just leaving a penny behind, mm -hmm. anything you grab. Even a quarter, right? Or, yeah. I mean, uh, if, you, if you put like a dollar coin or a half dollar or something in there, those are kind of, I mean, they're not rare coins. You can go to any bank and get them, but they're not exactly coins that we see commonly in circulation. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of an oddity. So I think those are neat to trade. Quarters okay maybe but if you're just trading like pennies and stuff i would avoid that personally okay okay is it okay then to take something out and leave money in its place well you get to that whole value <laughs> swap because it's exactly. the whole thing right. is of equal or greater value that you're supposed to leave so, you know, it, know. it really kind of depends. I mean, if it's yeah. one of those teeny tiny erasers and you swap it out for a quarter, you probably mm -hmm. safe on the value there. You know, I think it really just kind of depends. I, I agree. I mean, I don't think there's a, there's a direct answer. Um, now there was a series of caches in this area uh, where at one stop you picked up uh, on string. And then at the previous, the next stops, you pick up beads and you made your own necklace. Oh, that's fun, that's right. Neat. No trade needed, but you know, you had to go to all the stops that that was kind of fun. Right. But that takes some maintenance to keep up. That's an interesting idea. Now, one thing that I've done, cause I love, I love finding like the fake plastic coins. Mm -hmm. Those are fun for me. And one thing that I have done is I've gone on Amazon and you can buy 
a bag of assorted coins from different countries. Mm -hmm. And those are great for like smaller caches, especially because, you know, they're just small round coins, but they're interesting because it's, it's not your standard penny that you see right. in every day. So it's something a bit more unique. And I've done that before, but it's legitimate currency. Mm -hmm. And I've done that. But I almost feel like that's different because you're not going to find a penny from Argentina on most days, someplace, right. you know. There, there was a foreign currency cash that I found once that, you know, you know, you're, you're, I think it was the idea of, hey, if you've just traveled to a foreign country and you have some extra change, toss it here. And perhaps if somebody's going out to that country, they can pick that up and, you know, use it. Like, oh, that's an interesting idea. That is an interesting idea. But uh, make sure it fits. Yeah. Right? Don't force something into the container and go, you know what? I got a quarter turn on that screw top. It should be fine. And you've just ruined all the contents because they're going to get wet now. Yes. Yes. And don't like I had one that I, a cache that I owned, it was a, a larger magnetic key box. Mm -hmm. The lid got stuck shut because it was, you know, it's big enough for a key. So it fits the log, not much else. And somebody had shoved some, I don't remember what the item was, but some kind of swag in there. And I could not get the container back open. Right. And we ended up having to break the lid to get it open and then had to replace the key box, which was very frustrating <laughs> as the CEO. Right. Oh, well, I got it in and it fit. Well, yeah, but you didn't make it easy for the next person. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, just don't. How many times have I said that now? I should have um, kept. Counting. Yeah, it's got I, to be. I, I lost it. count. At least three. Oh. Do there you have a quota? Do we need to say it a few more times? Uh, I probably will anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about trackables? What kind of etiquette is there for track? Oh, you're hanging your head. <laughs> what kind of Tra etiquette is there for trackables? Trackables are my nemesis. I don't like trackables. I love trackables. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I don't want to take one and move it to another container, right? Because now I find, okay, first of all, I'll take it. In the early days, you had to take it, bring it back home, get online and say, oh, look, this is supposed to go to, you know, this is, I remember finding a motorcycle, you know, a little toy motorcycle with a tag. It wanted to travel on all the interstates. Okay, I can do that. Well, I was just on the interstates. I wish I'd known before. I did. Anyway. But now, you know, finding out what the goal of trackable is, is so much easier. Um, but finding a container that that trackable can go into is starting to become a challenge, right? Because everything is getting smaller. So the, the micros, the nanos, and there's no way you're putting a trackable in there. Uh, and finding the larger containers that can take a trackable is actually becoming a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and I can't tell you how many trackables... I have that you set goals for because it would be fun for, you mm -hmm. know, if it made it to New Zealand or someplace, you know, and uh, it gets moved in the complete opposite direction. Or it gets to somewhere like New York and just disappears. Oop. Yes. I had one that was a very small coin that could fit into a film canister. Okay. And during the summer, it got moved up into northern Canada. And so now maybe once a year, I get a log. Hey, I found this. I'm going to move it. And it doesn't move very far. And then the snow sets in and I wait a year. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you move it back down, down south where it's going to get some traction, please? <laughs> so speaking of missing trackables... That is a type of etiquette as well of if you see a trackable is not there, mm -hmm. log it is missing. Exactly. And I do that in my logs 
if I remember to look for them, right? It, or it's obvious. I look through them. There's no trackable in here. Um, yeah. And missing trackables. I mean, I see trackables for sale on eBay, right? Mm. Is that a proper way to get a trackable? You know, or people will say, hey, my, my trackable that's gone missing popped up on eBay. I just found it. Do you have to go buy it back? Right? Now, mm. some of this could be, uh, you know, the person's no longer into geocaching. They found this, you know, in a bag in the back of their car, you know, after three years. Okay. That, that's an honest mistake. Um, but you know, there, we, we had a rash of trackable thefts, you know, where they would hit, um, uh, the travel bug hotels and take everything out of them. Oh my gosh. You know, and they're gone. They're just gone. Somebody, you know, had a vendetta against geocaching and whatever. So, I mean, you know, I look at this and go, well, I don't think um, buying a trackable online is the right thing to do. Uh, meaning through an auction site that yeah. somebody had once owned. Um, you know, because if it's still in their collection, you can't ever move it to yours. No, and I, I recently had a very odd occurrence where and I have no idea how this happened. So I had bought a trackable and sent it out and it went missing. It happens. About a year or so later, another cashier sent me a message and she had bought a trackable and tried to activate it. And when she tried to activate it, it said that it was already active and belonged to somebody else. Hmm. She brought a brand new trackable. It just happened to have the same tracking code that my missing one had. Wow. Interesting. She actually bought, we both bought ours from geocaching.com. And somehow. Somehow they had a double print. Somehow there was a double print. Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, I've contacted them and. They're going to send me a new one. Do you want me to send you this one or just restart it? Oh. I was like, if you just want to drop it off, like that <laughs> would be awesome. So my trackable got a new life that way, but it was really weird incident. Um, not really weird. I've got a trackable here. It's completely invisible against my green screen um, <laughs> of the, the big island of Hawaii. There was an event there. Somebody made these acrylic trackables and they put the same number on all of them. Really? Yeah. So um, actually Wits End is the one who, who got it first. I took it and just took it out of circulation. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he logged it and somebody said, that's impossible. I've got, you know, I just put that in a cache yesterday. He goes, it's entirely possible. I'm holding it right here in my hand. Wow. No, no, I just dropped it yesterday. Well, I have a green. Oh, wait, mine was blue. Yeah, somebody used the same tracking number. So we have no idea how many of these are out there. But yeah, you know, if you're if you produce uh, them on your own, you, yeah, you can do that. That's so, true. It was the first time I've encountered such a thing. And I thought, you know what, this this I'm keeping is a good, bad example. <laughs> well, I. I think we've covered all the topics that I can think of for basic geocaching, finding, hiding, swag, trackables. Is there any others you can think of? Not really. So the, the short, the TLDR of this episode, just do it right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Life would be so much easier if we would just all do it right. <laughs> I have no problem with innocent mistakes. We all make them. Oh, I didn't know. Thank you. Now I've learned I can make a correction. But, you know, some of these I think are just laziness. Yeah, I know, but I didn't want to. I, I would agree. I, I have seen so many times somebody has written in the log for a geocache, hey, container was busted but never marked it as need maintenance right like just go that little extra step so it gets flagged or oh 
trackable wasn't in the cache, but they never posted it on the trackable page that it was mm -hmm. missing. Just go that little extra step. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, posting a missing trackable is tough. Somebody could have taken it and just not logged it yet. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe they're traveling. Right. So uh, in a week when I get back, then I'll log it that I have it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I can see the reasons and I'm sure it's innocent and you think you're doing the right thing, but, um, you know, information flows very easily in this age. Just use it. That it does. Well, you have graciously agreed to do a cash highlight for us and you've teased a little bit about this one earlier and it's yeah, GC11JEG. It's called Where Stairs Go to Die. That's a very uh, it, ominous name. Isn't it? Um, here, I live in the city of Tacoma, and we have a long waterfront. And there's this one spot along the waterfront where it looks like they've dumped a bunch of cement stairs. Really? Yeah. And so they're all, you know, these concrete pieces. Um, so, you know, okay, it could be anywhere in this. Um, this one has, this cache has 232 DNFs compared to 243 Fs. Is that how we say it? Finds. <laughs> um, and six needs maintenance logs, right? It is an incredibly tough one to find. Um, I would go walking with the family down at the waterfront and... I was like, okay, we've walked upon this. I've got to go look. Give me some time. And, you know, after 15 minutes, the kids are like, dad, come on. Okay, fine. I didn't find it today. I'm, you know, I probably did six or eight of those. You know, let's spend 15 minutes looking for this. It is uh, marked as a three and a half difficulty, two and a half terrain. Uh, so there were a couple of times I decided I'm going to spend an afternoon looking for this. I will want to find this cash. And no, um, there was a nearby event and some people go, Hey, let's go look for this one. Yes, let's go. I will take you there. Right. <laughs> and there's you know, six of us walking along the beach in that area. We can't find it. And one day as you know, I'm just, it's like, it's here. Uh, I it's, I believe at that time it was the closest cash to me that I had not found. Okay. So that just, you know, it, every time I open the map, it just mocks me. It rubs Sit, salt in the wound. Yeah. Fine. I'm going to go down. And I went down and I just happened to get in the right position. And I turned my head and there it was. It was hanging out in the open, but you had to be at the right place and at the right angle to see it. Um, it would not have surprised me if I touched it a dozen times. Really and didn't recognize what it was. Um, it was just a bugger. And I know I didn't log all my DNFs on that one. You know, I logged a few. I tried, I tried. Like, uh, you know what? I didn't really I, I'd like to come up with a new acronym, R O O T, ran out of time. Right. Oh, I didn't yeah. I wasn't able to put in a good search. So I'm not gonna count that as a DNF. Now, when that happens to you, do you write a note on the cache page? No. No? No. There there came a point, it just became so angry. I didn't want to acknowledge it at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but how can this be? Um, there's another one by the same hider, uh, probably 525 feet away, uh, 528 feet away, that uh, same container, little different location. And it was just a bugger to find. So is it is it because of the container and how it blends in that makes it so difficult? Um, this one is uh, a little brass container about the size of a nano. Okay. On a on a keychain, I think it is either a pill container or or like a dog information that okay. you can put on their collar, right? Yeah. Um, and. It's just, you know, it's like hanging a, a nano in a bush, 
right? That that would be pretty tough to find unless you're looking in the right spot. And being brass, it blends in more than something that was would stick out if it was black or okay. you know silver. Um, but a but a burnished brass uh, just is kind of a wooden colored, and it was just it was just terrible to find. From all the DNFs versus the hide, no, I mean, it's it's almost 50-50 right. of logs. I'm surprised it's not a level five cache difficulty five. Uh, you know, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it, here's another one, another failure, even with my brother uh, who had found it before, right? And again, if you're not in the right position, you just can't see it. Um, search for 40 minutes. Uh, somebody else came and we searched for two hours. Still couldn't. <laughs> right. Wow. Uh, here, here's one. Here's a log. Uh, I don't think it should be a difficulty three and a half as no one has found it in a year. Very tricky stuff. So spent a good hour. Uh, you know, it just, it's an evil hide. It sounds like an evil hide. That's, oh, wow. So, um, I, I see that um, a few months ago, it was, it was disabled by the cache reviewer because of so many DNFs on it. Oh, wow. And then the uh, um, CO says, no, I went and checked on it. It's there. It's just, it's just an evil hide. Yeah, I really feel like the difficulty rating needs to be yeah increased. Is the terrain rating about accurate from what you yes. say? Um, so... There's a nice walkway. Um, there's a nice cement walkway uh, uh, along the waterfront there. And this is a grassy area. Then it drops off to a little cliff, right? Probably four feet, five feet. Um, there are ways around. You can walk around, but this is right at a cliff. Okay. So, yeah, you know, you, you, you have to want to go there. Okay. So yeah, it's been disabled several times actually. Now I'm looking through the log because of all the DNFs. I just don't understand why they don't increase the difficulty level. I don't. I don't know. But I just know um, when I found it and I saw it, I just stared at it for a while. I'm like, are you <laughs> just hanging there? Yeah, it wasn't hidden. It wasn't. It may have been behind things. But at the angle I looked at it, it was completely, there, there had to be, you know, a good foot of open space and it was in the middle of it, you know, like a, uh, a cubic foot of space. And it was just hanging in the middle of it. I'm like, how did I ever miss this? And I bet today, if I go back, I would still have trouble finding it. That's wild. Mm -hmm. That is a really well blending in cash hide. It's, it's. It's the perfect cache for that location if you want something difficult, right? If you're looking for a quick Walmart park and grab, this isn't it. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> so where stairs go to die, go, uh, go spend some time, see if you can find it. And if you need anybody to mock you while you're looking for it, I'll volunteer. <laughs> That's so generous of you. Oh, thank you. It's a service <laughs> I offer. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and, and talking with me today and talking cash etiquette and sharing this cash highlight. It has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. This is a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to Geocache Adventures. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have you heard of FTF Magazine? It's the magazine for geocachers filled with articles and snippets sent in by geocachers just like you. I'm a subscriber myself and I love it. Check them out today at ftfgo.com and tell them Shadow Dragon 1 sent you. Would you like to be a guest on a show or have a topic you'd like to hear covered? Reach out and let me know. Just go to the geocacheadventures.org website and click on the contact page to reach out. Mm -hmm.